I realized when many of you ask questions after the uh, break, so I forgot to say something which I found important first, but then uh, got distracted. So uh, the reason why I wrote this representation was I wanted to explain why, uh, 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 I mean, <coughs> why is this interesting also to generate representations of, of dual unitary circuits beyond qubits, so for qubits, right? Uh, for qubits, you can simply replace SZ, uh, sigma z with SZ. Let's say you take a spin j, where d is equal to 2j plus 1, right? You take a S spin j representation of SU2, which has dimension 2j plus 1, and then uh, these are like now SUD. Uh, single qubit gates, and it's all surviving. So this again, I mean, it's the same complex. I mean, the same exercise to show now this is dual unitary, right? Of course, it's by far not complete. I mean, uh, not any dual unitary for the d-dimensional system can be written like this. But it is an interesting family, uh, which is inspired by dual unitaries for qubits, right? It's like representation high-dimensional irrep of SU2, right? Um, <clears throat> In particular, it's interesting also to study the classical limit. Now one can study classical limit. One can start, start, let j to infinity, and then this uh, quantum spins. And then, of course, you can think of this as, again, some classical rotation. So all this uh, ui can now be e to the i uh, h, let's say, s, s x, for example, right? So you can take fields in transfer, transverse field, right? <coughs> this would be a transverse field kicked Ising model with a swap. Right. The swap is important and it's not uh, Ising interaction, it's important, it's, it alters the model. But, but a part of this is just a kind of a classical, I mean not classical, well, it's semi-classical if you want Ising model uh, with transverse field. But the remarkable point is that this can be led to now taken to classical limit. So now you can go to classical limit and then this becomes uh, chaotic classical dynamics of, of classical spins, right? You could now think of classical maps propagating points on a sphere, classical sphere spins at points on a sphere. And uh, this map has some nice features. It's symplectic, which means it conserves Poisson structure, Poisson bracket. But now it's also dual symplectic, which means one can define a transverse spatial dynamics, which is also classical and is also symplectic. And one can now uh, compute correlation functions for this classical many body map analytically, also in terms of this now classical Markov chains, right? This M plus and M minus now becomes infinitely dimensional. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, in the classical limit, they become infinitely dimensional classical uh, uh, stochastic matrices. <clears throat> and their spectra determine the care of correlations. So that, that, that program has been actually done. I mean, this was a work we've done together with a uh, student in Sergi, uh, uh, Alexios uh, uh, Christophilus and, uh, 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 Andrea De Luca and uh, Di Marco Brigin. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's a nice cu curiosity. I don't know if it will turn out to be uh, how much development will be stimulating, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a curiosity that you can also do dual unitaries for classical, so classical, classical chaotic, ca chaotic map lattices. <clears throat> Okay, now let's go back to our discussion of spectral, spectral correlations. Uh, so, <clears throat> now uh, once we define the spectral form factor, let's discuss its uh, kind of essential scales. Uh, so you are, now you see the reason why I decided to put this strange normalization factor here so that we get no normalization here. So this is, uh, uh, I mean, this is, Sometimes people define it differently, but okay, for us, this will be the, I mean, uh, I did a mistake here if you want. Uh, well, yeah, the way I defined eigenvalues with the minus here, I have to put minus here and plus there, but it doesn't matter, it's the same. So it's a modulus square of the trace of u to the t. <clears throat> so now there are two time scales. There are time scales which are uh, uh, related, I mean, well, there is basically a single time scale which is completely universal, and that's related to the density of states, right? The density of states is basically n, number of, uh, number of levels. 
So there is the spacing between adjacent levels which goes like one over n, right? It goes like two pi over n. So now this defines a time scale, meaning that there is a time such that this will become of order two pi. <clears throat> and this time scale is called Heisenberg time. So now, right, because what, end, what, what happens with the dynamics, right, I mean, you see, I mean, maybe there's another, maybe it's instructive to write another representation of spectral form factor. I mean, just multiply these two terms. Then it is n comma n prime uh, e to the i phi n minus phi n prime times t, okay? So it's like, uh, you see, it's like a sum of quasi-random terms, right, which become really quasi-random after time t, which is larger than mean level spacing, right? Larger than inverse mean level spacing. I mean, larger than inverse minimal spacing. There is a minimal spacing which is of the order of uh, one over n. If time becomes larger than n, then this becomes a multiple of two pi. I mean, then even the smaller spacing uh, generates uh, kind of the coherent sort, the, you know, the phasing relations. Uh, I mean, all these terms are now completely kind of defaced and uh, they be, can be considered as quasi-random. So uh, <coughs> what I want to say is that there is an absolute maximal time, Heisenberg time, after which a uh, spectral form factor becomes completely structureless. You cannot have any structure anymore. So for any kind of uh, ensemble of random matrices or for any class of dynamical systems for times Longer than Heisenberg time, there is nothing really interesting anymore. <coughs> There's just quantum uh, recurrences, nothing else. <coughs> okay, <coughs> now let's see how does, uh, uh, let's sketch how does spectral form factor look like for uh, typical classes of, uh, uh, universal classes of, I don't know, random matrices. So spectral form factor in random matrix theory. So there is the Heisenberg time. <coughs> and uh, Heisenberg time is of the order n, you see. And then there is a scale n also associated to the spectral form factor. <coughs> and so what can happen is, so there is a special uh, value n. And it turns out that spectral form factor basically cannot be substantially larger than n, but it can approach n. So, uh, and then there are different, different types of random matrices. Uh, the so-called Dyson's threefold way. There are three fundamental classes of random matrices, uh, which are unitary. Uh, they, this is related to standard uh, Gaussian random matrix ensembles, uh, but I'm using uh, unitary rather than Hermitian matrices. So these are called Dyson's circular ensembles, but they're completely analogous to standard Gaussian ensembles. So there is a unitary ensemble, which is called CUE, which is just a unitary group. It's equivalent to a unitary group with a hard measure. Uh, so the idea is, if you don't know anything about your evolution operator, you replace it with a unitary group. This is the kind of uh, a variant of random matrix ansatz uh, for unitary matrices, but usually what people do is they replace a Hamiltonian by a random Hermitian matrix. Now we replace a unitary by a random unitary matrix and see what happens, right? And then we can compute, people have computed spectral form factor for unitary matrices. So basically you average over unitary group. There is a well-defined integral over the unitary group with a hard measure, which you can evaluate. No, it's just U. Trace u square, model of square. Trace u to the t, model of square. <coughs> and this can be computed. I mean, there are tricks in random matrix theory which allow you to compute this. There are actually, there are some very nice tricks, but I have no time to talk about them. Uh, <coughs> so it's a very nice function. It is a linear function of n, and then it plateaus when uh, at n. So basically, it's a stepwise linear function. It goes like linearly to n, and then it plateaus. Uh, <coughs> so these are, uh, and usually what you have to do is you have to use this, I mean, there is this standard wisdom, right? When you use each of the random matrix ensembles, 
uh, you use unitary ensemble uh, for systems where there is no uh, time reversal symmetry, right? Time reversal or any other so-called anti-unitary symmetry, anti-unitary symmetry. So when there is no time reversal in your chaotic model, then the common wisdom is to use a uh, unitary ensemble, uh, either CUE or in the Hamiltonian case, GUE, right? <clears throat> and uh, by the way, I mean, the four spectral form factor is the same for circular and for Gaussian matrices, right? So because we have to do thermodynamic limit at the end, I mean, this one actually is the same even for finite and, well, <clears throat> I have to be careful, I mean, for Gaussian, uh, ensembles, of course, uh, time is continuous, so there are some corrections, but in thermodynamic limit is the same. <clears throat> uh, now, when you have uh, time reversal or other unitary, anti-unitary symmetries, then you have to use orthogonal, orthogonal, a uh, circular orthogonal ensemble, uh, which is formed of matrices V, which can be written as U times U transpose, where U is, uh, is sweeping over unitary group uh, with respect to the Hahn measure. So this, this ensemble is not a, a, group, a group anymore. I mean, these are kind of, uh, I mean, the first ensemble was really a group, regroup. This one is not. So these are complex symmetric matrices. You see, the way that's written, this means that V itself is symmetric, but it's complex. So it's not like uh, in Gau uh, Gaussian uh, Hermitian ensembles in GOE, where this is a real ma uh, Hamiltonian, now we cannot write it as a real, uh, so this is not, sometimes people make the stupid assumption that this is just orthogonal matrices, right? These are not orthogonal matrices. These are complex matrices which are symmetric, <coughs> which correspond to, to, to systems without time reversal, right? And then for that, people can compute spectral form factor, which is, well, now we have, <coughs> again, you can just do an integral of a unitary group, but you have to compute, uh, U, U transpose to power T modulus square. And then you get, uh, again, analytic result, which is 2T minus T times log of 1 plus 2T over N. I mean, it's a funny object for T less than N, and 2N minus T log, log, uh, 2t plus n divided by 2t minus n, or t larger or equal n. <coughs> now uh, we don't have to we don't have to, uh, to 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 remember that. But what is important is that this starts with a slope two. So for small time it starts with a slope two, and then it goes with twice the slope of the unitary, and then it goes goes uh, like this smoothly to the plateau, right? So well, this is uh, uh, CUE, this is a COE. And then there is another ensemble, which is the symplectic matrices, which I will skip uh, for my discussion, but uh, complex, uh, sorry, uh, uh, circular symplectic ensemble, um, which has slope one half, and then it has a, a spike, but I will say, I mean, probably I should uh, not even discuss it because it's not, uh, it'll not be important for the rest of our discussion. Just to let you know, there is a third ensemble which corresponds to uh, spin one half systems with uh, odd, uh, odd total spin. Uh, <clears throat> so with half integer total spin. Uh, and uh, time reversal, and uh, uh, time reversal which has Kramer degeneracy. So time reversal which squares to minus one. Uh, <clears throat> But I, as I say, I will shut up now. I will not say anything else. And then the third ensemble, which I have to discuss, is the so-called Poisson ensemble. <coughs> which are not really random matrices, or if you want, they are random matrices, but they are diagonal matrices, which have uh, uh, Poisson that is uh, random IID phases distributed, uh, like IID between 0 and 2 pi. Phi n are i i d uniform on zero to two pi. <clears throat> For that, uh, I give you an exercise, uh, which is instructive. 
So this is really easy exercise, but it's still instructive to compute spectral form factor. It can be done, you see, I mean, you can imagine, these are IID complex numbers, so you can average out everything. And what you get is spectral form factor for this ensemble uh, is just flat. It's always equal to n for t, which is different from zero, of course. So for Poisson ensemble, we have this. And this is usually re related to integrable systems. So there is a conjecture. There are two conjectures, uh, two main conjectures. One is called Bohiga's conjecture. Or I prefer to call it quantum chaos conjecture. There were other people before Bohigas who understood it quite well. Uh, <clears throat> so Bohigas conjecture says that uh, when you have a chaotic system, chaotic dynamical system, you have you have to have random matrix uh, spectral correlations, spectral correlations. Now it goes one way. So, uh, well, it, I think it goes both ways, but yeah, it, it's identified. I mean, when you have uh, 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 chaotic dynamical systems, but you have to have a proper definition of chaos, which means, which is here meant uh, when you have a classical dynamics, where the system has a classical limit and classical dynamics is chaotic, then you expect random matrix spectral correlations. I mean, this, this conjecture is not proven. Uh, there are some heuristic uh, ideas which I will briefly d discuss in the, co in the following. Uh, so for a physicist's taste, the uh, mechanism is known, uh, but uh, for a mathematician's taste, uh, there is still, uh, proof is still lacking. So it's a uh, very deep conjecture. Um, and uh, it uh, associate chaos with random matrix spectral correlations. And this is what I'm going to take also as a definition of quantum chaos for dual unitaries and uh, other, let's say, uh, <coughs> interacting uh, spin, uh, spin chains or, or, or many body systems alike. And then there is another conjecture which is, well, I mean, it, it is well known, but it's less well known as a classic conjecture. It's called Barry Tabor conjecture. Which says that when you have integrability, integrable dynamics, then uh, you have Poisson spectral correlations. So this, this conjecture was formulated the way, I mean, Bohiga's particle was 1984, and this other conjecture was formulated even before 1977 by famous Barry and Tabor. Uh, and they had very nice uh, geometric picture behind this. Uh, for systems which have few degrees of freedom and where you can write eigenvalues in terms of quantum numbers. Because when you have uh, integrability, then you can write, um, uh, at least in a semi-classical limit, you can write eigenvalues in terms of quantum numbers, in terms of the so-called uh, torus quantization. So you can write uh, Liouel Arnold tori. Uh, you can uh, find Liouel Arnold tori and you quantize them. I mean, you, you find that each eigenvalue is associated to particular torus where the actions are quantized, like even old uh, Niels Bohr taught us, right? I mean, that uh, one has to look at the actions around certain loops, and these actions have to be multiples of the uh, Planck constant. So there is a, <coughs> a very nice picture of Berry and Tabor, which showed us, in generic case, how this connects to Poisson statistics. Okay, so these are two classic, and some uh, classic conjectures which we will use as a working definition of chaos and regularity. <coughs> Okay, <clears throat> but as I say, I mean, my motivating question for the rest of my lecture is to, to show you some idea how one can, 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 can uh, I mean, some possible mechanism of one can find uh, random matrix spectral correlations in interacting many body systems like dual unitary circuits. <clears throat> okay. okay. Right, so now, uh, let me tell you now, since I went a little bit to uh, an old story of classical, uh, semi-classical quantum chaos. I will just continue for another five, 10 minutes there. 
uh, to tell you a little bit more on this history. <coughs> So that could be, uh, that goes in the subsection under title semi-classical, semi-classical chaos, and uh, periodic orbit theory. So this was like a, the main buzzword in the conferences and workshops which I attended as a PG student and uh, young uh, faculty in the end, end of 90s, uh, um, mid-90s. Uh, um, <clears throat> so this was all about periodic orbit theory. It was like, a, you know, then somehow, of course, things have got closed down, and uh, now probably most of people don't know what it is. But I think it's still worth reminding ourselves from time to time, uh, because it's been really uh, a nice program. So the, but the whole idea of this program was actually inspired by Barry, 85. So I will just now give you a two-line uh, two calculation of, of, uh, of spectral form factor for um, chaotic systems from Barry, uh, I mean, which will kind of uh, 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 explain at least the main uh, features of this random chaos conjecture, namely the linear ramp of spectral form factor. So as you will see, uh, <coughs> There is, I mean, this, uh, as I already tried to explain in, uh, before, I mean, there are different time scales, and spectral form factor covers uh, different, different regimes, right? Looking at short times means uh, long uh, quasi energy uh, ranges, right? And this is something like what people call spectral rigidity. If you look at spectra across large distances, you see that the fact that you have this ramp of spectral form factor, meaning that spectral form factor is much smaller than for integrable dynamics for, for independent levels. I mean, this comes from assuming that levels are independent random numbers, but in uh, reality, spectral form factor is in, let's say, uh, many body systems exponentially smaller, right? Because this gap between these two values is exponentially large, it's two to the L, right? So that's something which is really remarkable, and that has to do with what people call spectral compressibility or, uh, or, or, or long range, uh, 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 um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> spectral correlations <coughs> in random matrix spectra. But then you go to the very end, close to the Heisenberg time, you still have what is called correlation hole. So there is still a gap between uh, what you would get for random levels, and this is related to level repulsion. So level repulsion, you know, you have probably seen, you know, what people like to, 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 to draw in uh, numerical investigations is the is the distribution of level spacings. When you take two adjacent uh, quasi-energies and you look at distribution of level spacings and for uh, Poisson independent uh, Poisson uh, spectra, you have Poisson statistics, that is level spacing is, a Poisson, is, is exponential, but for uh, chaotic spectra, which, uh, come, uh, which are associated to random matrix ensembles, you have uh, the so-called Wigner-Dyson or uh, a distribution which has a gap, I mean, which has uh, uh, um, probability which that vanishes for, for small spacing. So that's, that's referred to as level repulsion. So level repulsion can be mapped, uh, can be identified with uh, spectral form factor, a behavior of spectral form factor at times which are close to Heisenberg time, but still, I mean, there is a gap uh, because the spectral form factor is smaller than Poisson, which is manifestation of a level repulsion. And now the bar Barry offered already many, many years ago, that he offered a uh, very clever and uh, cute argument why you should have a ramp of spectral, why you should have a linear ramp of spectral form factor. And this, this is something that I think it needs to re be reminded because it's so, so cute. So um, <clears throat> I will now elaborate on this argument, a version of this argument for Floquet system. So usually it's given for, free. sorry, for? Yeah, 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 of course, yeah, you have also a linear ramp. There is just different slope. But these slopes can be explained as well in terms of simple argument due to Barry. But uh, let's ignore the symplectic case, just to for simplicity. So, so I will now r write the version of, the, of the Barry's argument for Floquet systems. So 
So the idea is to write trace of u to the t. So now the main, the main uh, um, question in this game is to be able to write uh, in one way or another some analytical analytical formula for the trace of u to the t. And the trace of u to the t is, as I already maybe, well, I'm not sure if I have already explained sufficiently well, but it's like, you know, it's even simpler than correlation function. Correlation function was like uh, having two observables. This is very clean, I mean, no observables. So this is like really a partition sum of a classical vertex model, but with complex weights, with very simple boundary conditions, right? It's just a trace. It's periodic boundary conditions, right? You have, which means you have u to the t, but then you take a trace, which means you identify these this qubits, right? This is one, two, three, four, and but you know, when you take a trace, you have to do the periodic boundary conditions. Now, if you take periodic conditions in, in space, then basically this is like a partition sum on a two-dimensional discrete torus, right? Per periodic in time, periodic in space. So now the question is, can you do something like this? I mean, now I'm, I'm sorry, I'm now jumping back and forth between semi-classical and quantum many body. Now let's go to semi-classical, right? Forget about spin chain for the moment, just for the moment, and see what Barry taught us for, I mean, and then we'll try to find some parallel to that, but you know. So now, uh, what you can do, I mean, just uh, following, I don't know, following textbook of Feynman and Hips, for example, if you re read a te beautiful textbook of Feynman on path integrals, right? You know that, uh, uh, this is just a propagator, right? This is a propagate, trace of propagator to power t. So that's, this can be written in terms of a path integral, which is a uh, uh, sum over all classical trajectories, right? With, uh, which are closed, right? Which are periodic, which are periodic with time t, right? This t is t iterations of a Floquet dynamics. And here it is a classical action, right? It's, uh, divided by h bar, right? So that's, that's a nice formula, but now you can do stable point approximation or stationary phase approximation to this formula. Now when h bar is small, you can do saddle point or stationary phase, which means you look for all trajectories for which this phase, the action is stationary, right? And these are just classical trajectories, right? This is a classical uh, variational principle, right? Which give us classical dynamics, but now the condition is periodicity, so it's a periodic trajectories. So basically, uh, you can write this in terms of uh, <coughs> periodic trajectories of length, periodic trajectories of length t. So sum over all periodic trajectories of length t. Sometimes there are countable sums. I mean, then the question is, I mean, what does this sum mean, right? Uh, and it turns out that for some nice chaotic systems, this sum is countable, so that you can actually organize these trajectories into a meaningful sum. <clears throat> and uh, and then whatever is left here from this path integral is just a sum which has two term, which has uh, individual terms, and each term has an amplitude and a phase. So phase means just the classical action evaluated at the value of the saddle point or stationary point, and the the the, the prefactor is some Jacobian, re, you know, some some something related to the Lyapunov exponent of the periodic trajectory, right? So it's. Uh, it's the inverse, basically. It's the inverse Lyapunov exponent. So it's like inverse Jacobian, which means that the more chaotic trajectory, the less, the less it contributes. Okay, but it's a, in a way that it makes it convergent, well, or at least somehow convergent, well, not really convergent, but you know, conditionally convergent for, for, for a nice chaotic dynamics. And then whatever we have to do now, remember what we have to do now is we have to compute trace of u to the t modulo square, which means you have to just come up with uh, product of two sums <laughs> and then what Barry suggested is that this double sum is a horrible double sum but it basically you can use random uh, a kind of uh, uh, assumption of uh, how you call this a random phase approximation right that uh, you know all the terms for which these two terms I mean because these are large numbers right uh, h bar is small, so these are large numbers. And these large numbers will give you many multiples of 2 pi, so it will give us a kind of pseudo-random contributions which we cancel out, unless these two actions are exactly the same. So that is the so-called diagonal approximation.
in the diagonal approximation when this p is equal to, so what we want is sp is equal to sp prime. Not p is equal to p prime, but we want the actions of, you know, we want in these terms that the action of the trajectories are the same. And now you see why time reversal becomes important because when you have trajectories, then the systems which have time reversal symmetry, the periodic trajectory, which is kind of closed in phase space, uh, has another trajectory which is just its time reversed partner. So it's, it can be paired with itself or it's, it's time reversed partner. So it's like a simple sum of AP square plus a factor of two which happens in case of time reversal. In case of time reversal invariance, right? So that's a clean uh, argument why you should, I mean, how you could explain just from dynamics that uh, ramp has a slope two for orthogonal or for systems with time reversal compared to systems for generic systems, right? It's just a factor of two. But then there is this uh, sum of Jacobian squared, inverse Jacobian model squared, and that is actually another kind of interesting observation which is, can be proven, it's a rigorous mathematical theorem, that this is just equal to T. The kind of sum rule, and it is known as uh, Hanai Osorio de Almeida sum rule. It's again a well-known thing in classical Hamiltonian chaos theory. And then once you have this, then this is just T or 2T for systems which don't have time reversal or systems which have time reversal. <clears throat> so that was a various argument and uh, people have then struggled to do more. Uh, I will now skip the rest for this cl semi-classical game. Then there was uh, uh, a tour de force of uh, effort uh, of many groups which culminated in 2004 with the kind of derivation of uh, not proof but derivation of random matrix spectral form factor from periodic theory. It was uh, um, Fritz Hake and company. I mean, this was, he was the leader of a group in Essen uh, and many clever collaborators, we were, they were able to figure out uh, the whole combinatorics of this. I mean, it's a complicated combinatorics. It turns out that you have to then pair not only these orbits, but, you know, orbits which are now related more remotely uh, to, 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 to obtain high order terms. I mean, this was like just a leading order term, which was good for short times, but then to get all the terms of random matrix, you had to do much more. But it turns out it's possible, right? So then it's, uh, this is now un understood, right? Now let's go to many body physics. I mean, this is, uh, it was just a warm up, but now let's say what we can say for a many body system. <coughs> huh? What do you think it's a, it's a, well, it's, 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 a, it's a sum rule. So yeah, it's a, well, you cannot, uh, I, ha I think you have to assume that your model is uh, hyperbolic or uniformly hyperbolic. So all trajectories have to be unstable, so it has to be chaotic. So. I don't think I can give you an intuitive explanation for harmonic oscillator. I mean, I don't know because for harmonic oscillator, okay, so let's say uh, for harmonic oscillator, uh, what, what do you mean? First of all, uh, I mean, um, first of all, I assume that we have flow dynamics, otherwise I would have to uh, write something slightly different, but for Flocky dynamics, okay, you can think of uh, what? Uh, Peaked harmonic oscillator or what? Uh, I mean, you know, a harmonic oscillator has uh, very strange periodic trajectories. First of all, it has just one periodic trajectory, right? I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it, all, 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 in other words, all periodic, all tra periodic trajectories have the same period, right? <laughs> I mean, it's a monochromat monochromatic system, right? It's uh, strange, right? It's, uh, I mean, harmonic oscillators are always bad, right? When you do chaos, they're always strange. No, I, didn't, I didn't get you. I mean, can you speak up? Yeah, even if it's, oh, sorry. Uh, as harmonic, we can consider some one-dimensional motion. I mean, it, it resolves this problem with uh, monochromaticity. But then we can yeah. just semi-classically quantize all the trajectories, understand more or less the density levels, and 
probably this calculation will lead to? to uh, I don't know. But as far as I remember, I mean, uh, it's crucial to assume that the trajectories are, 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 are unstable. Uh, so you need chaos. And then one dimension would not work. Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, you know, it's... Uh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's really a sidetrack for us, so it's just... <clears throat> I can give you the reference if you want to check. I mean, it's, well, maybe I can just write it down. So these are two postdocs or students of Michael Berry. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> okay, uh, now, um, okay, let's go back to spin chains. But before going to chaotic spin chains, I, did, I don't know how I'm doing with time. Yeah, okay, so probably have to speed up a bit. <clears throat> but still, I wanted to give you, a, at least I will give you another exercise, right? <clears throat> because there are a couple of things which can compute very easily and still are useful to build intuition. Spectral form factor in spin chains. <coughs> so now I will just take an example. We start with an example non interacting independent quantum spins. I mean, I will assume also for most of the rest of my lectures that D is equal to 2. So uh, you can call this spin on half chain, if you want, a qubit chain. And I will first consider an example of non-interacting independent quantum spins on half. <clears throat> okay, if you want, I mean, in the context of localization, you can also call this L bits. So suppose the system is non-ergodic, suppose it would, be, uh, it would be many body localized, then you can reduce it to independent spins. Uh, and the question is, can you then compute spectral form factor for such a model? So, I mean, I just tried to argue that, you know, it could be more general than just right away having independent spins. But as such, <clears throat> then uh, I will assume that my, uh, <clears throat> my, 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 my gate can be written as a, my, my time evolution now can be written as a product, tensor product of N Q, uh, L single qubit gates, where each single qubit gate is just, let's say, for simplicity, let's just say transverse field. So it has a transfer field H, so it just rotates, qubit just rotates around the z-axis with a coupling to a magnetic field uh, of strength H, right? And now let's just assume that these are like random fields. So let's assume that we have no interaction, but what we can have is still a general kind of rotation, but which will be different for every side, right? <clears throat> so this corresponds basically to Hamiltonian. This corresponds to Hamiltonian dynamics, where Hamiltonian is because these are independent, so we can just add it up, right? Because they are commuting. So you can write it in terms of e to the minus h, when this h is sum over j from 1 to L, h, j, sigma, j, z. <clears throat> okay. And now, a question. Uh, can we compute spectral form factor for that? <clears throat> and now we have a very nice handle on averaging, right? I explained to you already that we don't expect spectral form factor to be self-averaging. Now, uh, what uh, can we do here? We can average over random longitudinal or whatever random fields. So we can define spectral form factor as an average over this ensemble of independent spins where I take expectation value with respect to vector of h, trace of u to the t, trace of u to the minus t. <coughs> and now there is a calculation I wanted to do on board, but 
I mean, uh, I invite you to do it yourself because uh, I want to move, it, move, move, move a bit faster. Um, yeah, it's still, I don't know, I mean, I'm a bit unhappy since that, that I'm not doing it, but uh, <clears throat> because, uh, well, anyway, I will, <clears throat> I will skip it. So, but as you see, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, it's just an exercise of manipulating tensor products, right, and traces of tensor products, right? Uh, so one thing you can do immediately, you can write this as expectation value of trace of u to the t tensor product u to the minus t, right? And then you separate, and then you separate the expectation value uh, 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 on each independent spin separately. And then what you get at the end of the day is expectation value of independent spins. And then you take a trace of each independent spins, which is one is minus two i h t, and the rest of the details, I invite you to do it yourself. So I'm mean, just writing. Uh, now this is the last matrix, which corresponds to the last tensor product of a two, 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 two by two matrices, and then everything is to power L, of course. But now you do expectation value. Now these are random spins, right? I mean, I assume that oh, sorry, these are random fields, and assume these fields are kind of flat in zero to pi. So this cancels, this cancels, and then the result is two to the L. The result is flat, so it's the same as for Poisson ensemble. So it's just to show that independent random spins correspond to what you expect for regular integrable systems. Right. <clears throat> now let's to go to something much more interesting. <clears throat> Local interacting. Uh, now I will, for the sake of concreteness and in the view of the lack of time, I mean, I wanted maybe to to show you also the general statement of, for general uni dual unitaries, but this I have to skip. So I will close my lectures by just outlining a calculation for a specific class of dual unitary models, which are kick teasing models, which are like maybe <clears throat> more intuitive than the most general dual, un dual unitary circuits. So I will now d discuss SFF in locally interacting kick teasing model. So this is also how we came up with this. Uh, I mean, this was like the first result uh, which we had for, for spectral form factor. Uh, <clears throat> but I think still for the pedagogical purposes, probably the easiest to explain. So, uh, <clears throat> or at least uh, it has the, maybe the most uh, physical uh, kind of interpretation in terms of something which is discussed a lot throughout the literature. So. This is like related to transverse field easing model, which is a popular model on its own. So now what we will do is we'll take a, like a transverse field easing model, but we will, or two field easing model, transverse and longitudinal fields, but we will take a, 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 a kicked, uh, we will kick it with transverse field. So what I mean now is take a time dependent Hamiltonian with a vector of longitudinal fields. So now I will assume, I will use the same notation, I will take a vector of longitudinal fields uh, and this is a time-dependent Hamiltonian. It has the easing part, which depends on longitudinal fields, the vector, plus uh, a kick. And this kick means that this piece of Hamiltonian is switched on and off in a passed way with delta, train of delta, spaced, uh, let's say, I assume that the time, the period of the drive is equal to one. And then the easing part is just classical easing model with external field if you want. So there is a, a coupling J. And uh, uh, so coupling, uh, <clears throat> easing coupling J and then longitudinal field HJ, which is potentially different for, every, for any side. <clears throat> This is with periodic boundary conditions. <clears throat> and then I have a kick, which is, which depends on a single parameter, which is called B, the transverse field strength, and sigma x. 
So now, uh, of course, I will immediately phrase it as a Floquet system, and I'll write a Floquet circuit for that. Uh, but I just wanted to start with the Hamiltonian. <coughs> so we could also think of how to realize it, maybe with some past uh, <coughs> fields. So now, uh, the Floki operator uh, corresponding to kick teasing model, I will put a label now, kick teasing, which explicitly depends on external fields. So this is also something that now changes with respect to previous lectures. Previously, I on purpose studied only non-disordered systems. So uh, I said, okay, we have a fixed gate. Let's make it translation invariant in space, also in time. Uh, now I will have to mess up with this order a little bit. Because, uh, because of non-self-averageness non of the spectral form factor, but I will switch off the disorder at the end of calculation. But it's important to have it, and it's important to average over it. And, it's imp and a cru crucial step of this calculation is to be able to compute averages over disorder. And there will be a trick which, depends, which will, will crucially depend on the fact that I have dual unitary circuit. So dual unitarity buys me a, buys me a lot because I can do disorder averaging explicitly and sometimes analytically. So this is like in a nutshell <coughs> the rest of my lecture. So I will try to explain to you in a brief, uh, in a simple example, how to do this order averaging. How to formulate doing this order averaging as a clean mathematical problem, right? And then you have to still solve this problem, and it's not so simple. So I will skip most of the steps, but as, at least I will connect it to a very intuitive, well, to a very simple problem, let's say, for which you can easily see intuitively what should be the solution. <clears throat> but I, as I say, I mean, the previous lectures were kind of very fundamental and uh, all the steps were kind of super simple and nothing was mysterious. I mean, this last part still will be hiding a lot of uh, uh, pages of proofs, uh, so I will warn you. I mean, I will not be able to do all the details here. <clears throat> okay, so now what is the, um, what is the uh, Floquet operator? You can write it in terms of two pieces, right? So this is kicked and this is easing. This one depends on the field. So you can just start your, you know, you, tend, you make time order product. You have time dependent Hamiltonian. It's a standard textbook quantum dynamics. You write time order product, but now you are just two terms, non-commuting terms, of course. These two terms don't commute, so you have to write these two pieces like this. <clears throat> okay, and then what we will have to, what we will want to do is to compute spectral form factor as expectation value with respect to field of trace of u easing to power t. Okay, uh, right, so now uh, it turns out, you know, that this easing model, I mean, now there is this uh, standard uh, kind of uh, analogy between uh, quantum dynamics in 1D and statistical physics in 2D, which we can now make completely explicit here. So what, the, what we can do now is we can write this uh, trace. I mean, the key thing, right, is to write this trace of the propagator as a partition sum, right? I already mentioned a couple of times. But now here we will be able to do it explicitly uh, in terms of a basically 2D easing model, right? This is a 1D kick teasing model. And uh, if you try to write out this partition sum, you see that it really looks like a 2D easing, a 2D easing model. So basically what we will do now, we'll take a kind of path integral, you know, with, again, this is like following basically the idea here. You write this as a path integral, but now it's a discrete time path integral. So you have to uh, slice uh, t times the complete set in between this propagator, and then what you get is basically um, sum over 
tau spin t spin configurations, which I will call S tau. So each tau corresponds to tau goes from 1 to t. And then you sum over, and this underline means that these are, uh, uh, this is uh, S tau 1, S tau 2, and so on to S tau L. Okay? So each uh, vector S tau is uh, a vector configuration of spins in 1D, but it depends on the index tau, which is also going across the other direction, which has tau values. <coughs> Now, uh, I mean, I, I will have to speed up a bit, so I will not write all the details of this derivation, but again, it's something that is completely straightforward, so the missing details, I invite you to, to try to, to, to do it yourself as an exercise. <coughs> um, so, um, right, uh, so once you do this, you see that you get, um, Again, sum over all spin configurations, let's call S, S uh, tau j. So that's like, it's like a partition sum over all configurations of a 2D classical spin, uh, spin lattice. <coughs> and then we have a product over tau and product over j. Goes from one to L, so you see this, this becomes a product over j because this is, uh, this is diagonal in the, in, the, in, the, in the computational basis, right? So you can write it immediately as a product over pairwise terms. Uh, and then there is a kicked term, but kicked term again is a product because it's a, uh, it's a, you know, it's a sum of in the un independent terms. But this is not diagonal, so it couples, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> right, so, uh, So let me just write it. Um, so the matrix elements of this guy, let's call them V, S tau J, comma S tau plus one J. So this couple is between S tau plus one and S tau. So S tau plus one, S tau, but the same J because it's a tensor product. So these are just matrix elements of each of these terms. So V, uh, S, S prime is just S e to the minus i b sigma x S prime. That's just a definition. And then there is this other part, which I said is also a product, j s tau j s tau j plus one plus h j s tau j. Okay. <coughs> and now, uh, yeah. Um, putting everything together, basically we can write it uh, really as a partition sum of an Ising model. So uh, skipping a little bit of details uh, here, which are, I mean, just straightforward, I can write this really as a, as a, as a simple partition sum, which is again a complex weight. This is L times T over two sum over all classical configurations, so S uh, tau j, e to the minus i, and then here it's an energy functional of this spin configuration, and a vector of magnetic fields, and this energy functional is the sum over two, dimension, two directions, tau going from one to t. It's periodic boundaries in periodic boundary conditions in both ways, right? And this is j, s tau, j, s tau, j plus one, plus j bar, s tau, j, s tau plus one, j. See, this is anisotropic to the Ising model. It has two different interaction constants, right? One in uh, horizontal direction, one in vertical direction, time is vertical. And then there is also a field which only depends on 
core, you know, on position, but not on time, so only on one direction. So it's like a classical 2D easing model in striped fields. So fields are only, fields are random, but the, they are modulated only in one of the two directions. They are flat in one and random in the other. <clears throat> but it's all classical. The only caveat is that it's classical, but the weights are not positive. So otherwise, it would be just classical stuff maker. And now, what is this? And what is this J tilde? You can figure out this J tilde from, the, from uh, this representation. It is minus pi over 4 minus i over 2 logarithm of tangent of b. So it's just parameter b now hidden somehow in the exponential. Okay, now we have to stare at this expression, right? This is a, uh, now we think, okay, we are doomed, right? Because uh, this is not integral, right? Baxter thought, I mean, people in uh, uh, gen uh, uh, geniuses like Baxter, I mean, they taught us how to solve Ising model or even Onsager before, but, um, <clears throat> and they claim that this type of freezing models are surely not integrable, so we forget about it, right? <clears throat> How, what can we do? I mean, if there was no external field, this would be integrable, so we could use Onsager's solution, or one of the beautiful Baxter solutions. But this, this is not integrable, so we have to do something else. But it's not hopeless. What should we do? So now I will use some diagrams, which are like, uh, a version of uh, tensor networks again, which will explain what we can do. So one thing we have to recognize, look, staring at this formula, is that we can easily switch between space and time. <clears throat> I mean, the structure of this formula is such that it is like a leasing model in both directions. So if we switch between space and time, we just have to replace j by j tilde and j tilde by j. And it is the same, I mean, structure, right? So basically, what we have, let's just write this partition sum. What we have is now really a nice Cartesian grid. Now, this is x and this is t. This is magnetic fields, h1, h2, up to hl. Then there are periodic boundary conditions. So now what we have done is basically we have wrote this as a partition sum of a two-dimensional classical-like Ising model, but uh, we started from uh, basically transfer matrix, right? I mean, uh, this was like, you know, in the beginning this was just a, a two to the L by two to the L matrix powered T times and doing the trace. So this is, in terminology of StatMec, this is called transfer matrix, right? So basically we evaluated, <coughs> we evaluated this partition sum in terms of a transfer matrix. Now I probably should use some colors, not to mess up completely the picture, but let's say this was a transfer matrix, which I called UKI. And I iterated it. <coughs> iterated it t times, and then I did the trace. Okay. Now what I can do, I can take instead this matrix, and this matrix I will call U tilde, KI, and this depends explicitly on HJ on the field at this particular wire, right? But otherwise, it has exactly the same algebraic structure because the problem is symmetric under exchange of space and time. You just have to change parameters, right? This is the same, but just I have to change parameters, j for j tilde, <coughs> and vice versa. So, I mean, there, <coughs> and then there is, uh, so basically what you have to do, we have to do, you have to take parameter j tilde, which is a function of j and b, and b tilde, which is a function of j and b. So this guy is a function of j and b, and this guy is a function of j tilde and b tilde. So there is a simple uh, transformation, which I can spell it out for you. Uh, well, I have not written it down explicitly. But there is a simple transformation, which is explicit, which allows us to form a column transfer matrix out of the row transfer matrix. So, so this might, the, 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 all the other differences, of course, this is a, a matrix which acts on a spin ring of T sides, right? 
So this is a 2 to the t by 2 to the t matrix. This was 2 to the L by 2 to the L, and this is 2 to the t by 2 to the t. So sometimes it's better to contract the other, sometimes one, sometimes the other, depending, okay. If t is short and L is long, it's much better maybe to contract along, uh, along uh, columns, right? Uh, uh, a yeah, depend, I mean, yeah, along columns because uh, it's easier to power a smaller matrix, right? Because you can diagonalize it, you, know, you can figure out if it's a spectral decomposition and then things become easy, right? <coughs> yeah. Where is util, with utilde is this uh, column, right? Yes. Yes. And u is the row, yeah. Dependence on? Right. J and B. J tilde and B tilde, right. What is B tilde? Ah, B tilde was... Uh, B tilde appears because you have to... Uh, uh, where was the... No, I mean, the B tilde appears because you have to now write J as, 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 you have to write now J in terms of B tilde. So basically you have to write J, okay. Maybe this should be right in the transformation, right? Log tangent B tilde, right? These two equations should give you this transformation, right? This is implicitly given this transformation, right? <coughs> so this is called space-time duality, I mean, or space-time flip. Um, this equivalence between the two, uh, the propagator in these two directions. Uh, this was the first time observed in the article by, by Boris Gutkin, uh, Thomas Guren company, uh, space-time duality. <laughs> now, but why is this useful? I mean, then the question is, is it really, I mean, it's like, cool, sounds like a super cool property, but in fact, this was like what preceded the dual unitarity. I mean, you dual unitarity is basically generalizing this, this feature, right? I mean, not completely because I have not yet said anything about unitarity, but now I will, what I will insist now, I will insist that this guy is unitary, right? It has the same algebraic form, but now I will ask him to be unitary, right? So I will, and, when is it unitary? It's unitary when this matrix, when this parameter J tilde and B tilde are real. So U is unitary if and only if J tilde and B tilde are real. Otherwise it's not, unfortunately, and we cannot do much. But why do we want it to be unitary? Well, for that I have to, for that I have to sketch another thing. So uh, for that I have to sketch the key trick, I mean, I think this will be the main part of uh, this uh, explanation uh, to show you how to, do, how to do the averaging, right? How to do the averaging of, of this object, right? But you see, this object is a two replica object. It has two traces, right? So I have to now, unfortunately, erase a little bit because I want to make another picture slightly below. <coughs> I will take a, a complete identical copy of this picture which represents, now this represents trace of u to the t, and this other picture will present, represent trace of u to the minus t. So it's just complex conjugate, okay? <coughs> Again, this is x, this is one, two to l, one, two to l, this is again time. And now the product of these two pictures, again, these are two independent tensor diagrams, tensor network diagrams, so if, since the things decoupled into product, there is no coupling, right? Seemingly no coupling, but there will be coupling because there will be averaging, right? We have to do the disorder averaging, and this disorder averaging will produce coupling, but let's see how. First of all, how we would do disorder averaging if we would contract along uh, the rows as we wanted at first, right? This would be impossible because this order is hidden in the, in the spatial modulation of the field. But now what we do, rather, is to contract along columns, where for each column, field is different, and in the subsequent column is completely independent. 
So what we can do, we can average over the field independently because field is IID. So if you contract this diagram column-wise, we can basically average locally, right? So then it becomes like a quantum channel, like a, a noisy quantum map where the field can be averaged over in each instance of the map, which now, because space becomes the new time, then you can average over this order because this order is IID in space. So that's the, 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 the key, the, the trick in the nutshell, right? So what we will do now, we basically take all these things together and we baptize it as a transfer matrix. <coughs> okay? <coughs> so that's how it goes. Basically, two replica calculation, disorder averaging is done by space-time flip. By doing space-time flip, then you can use the fact that disorder is IID and then we are in business. Okay? Okay, and the rest is uh, technicality. So I'll have to, yeah, I, I think I'll wrap up in 15 minutes <coughs> for sure. But uh, let me now just, uh, okay. <clears throat> so how does it go? Now let me do now this calculation. Uh, so now it's, now this is a three line calculation which I will do for you just uh, to make sure we all follow this argument. Now this is, uh, I will just put a star here which means complex conjugate of uh, of, of the matrix, <coughs> of the many body matrix. Just now this is still a vector of the fields, right? Now we, I'll do the duality, so, uh, so then there is this, <coughs> let's see, duality formula says that I can write trace of u kicked ising to power t as a product, as a trace of a product of uh, j going from 1 to L u tilde kicked ising of hj, right? I mean, instead of doing this sweep where I take the same propagate, uh, doing this sweep where, where this is the same at four, all times, but it has modulated field, I do this sweep where I have product of matrices with different local fields, but constant in, in, the, new, in, the, new, in the new space, which is the old time. <coughs> so these are constant field easing models, but they have different value of the, of the longitudinal field, right? Okay, great, so now we are doing that, so. And then I use again the fundamental feature that trace can be factored. <coughs> So basically, I can write now, um, let me think as a trace of the product of this guy, tensor, and this, this guy has to be a complex conjugate, right? Right, and now I can pull, uh, now I can, now I can plug this averaging inside, right, because now I can do averaging independently on each factor. So basically this is trace of the product j from 1 to L, and then I have expectation value of hj. Um, now this becomes, uh, yeah. Now you see, I mean, I can forget about J here, right? Because it's the local field, which is constant. Uh, it's just homogeneous in the new, in the new space. Uh, and it's, 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 it's uh, I mean, I, I do it independent averaging, so I can forget about J. So basically, I can also forget about the product here, but I can put here to power L. <coughs> and now I baptize this, as I say, as a transfer matrix, okay? So now I have basically reduced my problem of computing spectral form factor as a trace, as, as, a, as a, again, as a kind of partition sum of two replica uh, model, but uh, I mean, it's like a transfer matrix to some power, right? <coughs> some transfer matrix. Now, sometimes this transfer matrix acts on a tensor product of two spin 
spin chains, right? So this, this guy, sorry, it's uh, endomorphism, it's, it's uh, endomorphism of uh, 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 C two to the T cross C two to the T, right? <coughs> so it, 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 it is, uh, uh, I mean, it, it basically, it, it acts on two spin rings of T sides, right? One, two to T, and another one as well, one, two to T. And now, why do I need two spin rings? Well, I'm, I'm, these are the two spin rings, right? One and the other. But they are coupled. They are coupled because of the averaging. But this coupling is very nice. I mean, uh, now I, yeah, I will, I will try to do these steps, uh, two, two, two steps to, 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 to really <coughs> show explicitly how this matrix, this, this transform matrix looks like. But, um, feel tempted to go to the computer, but anyway, then I would probably lost you also. But so we better not to, to go into all the detail. <coughs> um, but so, right, so now, um, so let's see, I mean, what we want to do now. Let's, let's, let's assume uh, that uh, the field is Gaussian, right? Assume HJ Gaussian is Gaussian with field with mean H bar and uh, variance sigma square. Okay, so I will assume that this expectation value is evaluated as a Gaussian integral. So any function of H, I will compute as an integral minus infinity to infinity, Gaussian kernel, h over h bar divided by sigma square, dh over square root of two pi sigma. So now I want to compute, what do I want to compute? And then I also do uh, one thing, I mean, um, I define new kick teasing of h, which now depends on the local field, s kick teasing, so that's the, the, the dual kick teasing, I mean, that spatial kick teasing. But you see, I mean, I assumed uh, that, uh, probably I went too fast there, but I, I will assume and I have assumed that my U tilde is unitary. And unitarity of U tilde means that, I mean, I require that J, J tilde and B tilde are real, but uh, the fact that requiring J tilde and B tilde are real implies that they have to be equal, that J equal to B is uh, that all these parameters have to be equal in modulus, and this is equal to pi over four. So they are all either plus or minus pi over four. Now there are many cases, four different cases. I will not discuss all of them separately, but if you just stare at these two equations long enough, you will see that the only solution which makes j and b, j tilde and b tilde simultaneously real is the one where you start from pi over four, pi over four plus minus, and then also j tilde and b tilde are pi over four. So that's the that's the the, the values I will, uh, and this is the so-called self-dual point of the kick teasing model, which corresponds to dual unitary circuit. So in this case, this is a special instance of a dual unitary circuit. Uh, but I will not go into that because this I will. I mean, I decided to be just more specific, but uh, yeah, I could formulate these things also very generally, if I wanted. <clears throat> okay, so now, um, one useful identity is to isolate the Z field. Let's call uh, MZ, let's call M, with M I designate the components of magnetization, so total Z, so now it's, this is in time direction, so the summation index is tau, from one to T. Um, <clears throat> So I can always write like this, right? I remember how, how uh, kick teasing was formulated. It was here. So this was the, H easing was uh, diagonal and has only commuting terms. 
So you could separate uh, one body term from two body terms, and one body term is just this. It's just this diagonal, right? OK, and then uh, let's now simplify the calculation of the transfer matrix. Now it's a Gaussian integral. Plus. And what is nice now, I mean, again, I mean, uh, this is just algebra, right, of uh, manipulating tensor products. So what I can do now, I can write this as this tensor product this times this tensor product this. But then the first factor is independent of h. I can put it out of the average. So it's a unitary matrix, which is, which is just a transverse field Ising model, right? Uh, there is no longitudinal fields here, right? So this is unitary matrix, which is, by the way, also free fermionizable because it's just transverse field teasing. Very nice. And the rest is just a Gaussian integral of single body terms. I mean, a Gaussian average of them, I think. <clears throat> but then computing this, you get, it's a Gaussian integral, it's an exercise, right? Um, <clears throat> this is an exercise, so I will just spit out the result. It's again a Gaussian. to speed up a bit, so uh, I will try to flash just the main things, right? So what I, I get now is some super operator, right? You have seen super operators during this week already. So you can think of this as a vectorization of a super operator, right? What is it? This is like a taking commutator with respect to MZ. So it's like just this super operator squared and uh, back. Uh, so it's like a linear a quadratic form of this commutator with MZ, right? So I can basically pull up, uh, so what I will do at the end, I will put it, I mean, this two times commute, so I can just put this guy back inside here. So at the end of the day, I have a, a kind of a general expression for the transfer matrix, which is U kicked Ising, and now I go back with an evaluated average longitudinal field. And then times uh, something which I called a contractive map. Uh, which depends on the variance only, and this is like a Gaussian of a commutator. <clears throat> and remember, to just remind you what we are doing now, uh, I mean, we have already evaluated the spectral form factor as a, as a trace of this transfer matrix to power L. Um, <clears throat> okay, now this is for, now for this specific, specific dual unitary case of kick teasing model, this, this piece is unitary. And this is kind of contractive, or better to say non-expansive. So it has spectrum, I mean this, this is just exponential of a commutator, Commutator is a kind of Hermitian superoperator, so it has a spectrum which is real, and it is between zero and one, right? And it has eigenvalue one as well. It has eigenvalue one corresponding to all vectorized operators which commute with MZ. If you apply this to a vectorized operator which commutes with MZ, then eigenvalue is one because this is zero, and then e to the zero is one. So it has a non-zero kernel. I mean, non-trivial kernel, or if you want, non-trivial eigenvalue one eigenspace. That's, that's, of course, very, very important. Uh, so the point is now, because you see, I mean, we want to do the thermodynamic limit now, right? L to infinity. So what we want is basically to show that there is a kernel 
or eigenspace of eigenvalue one of this transfer matrix, which is non-trivial, right? So basically, this becomes a dimension of eigenspace, a number of eigenvectors of eigenvalue one, one of t. And uh, the second thing to show is that there is, so basically what we will show, what we will not show, but what we can show, I will just describe in five, in two, three minutes, what we can do with a lot of hard work, but nothing really, uh, I mean, the main, the main kind of uh, 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 progress is to be able to write spectral form factor in this way. I mean, the rest is just, you know, uh, really brutal, brutal mathematics. So, so what, what one can do is one can show that, first of all, that the, the, the eigenvalue one is degenerate and it has multiplicity, which is uh, t or 2t. Now, in our case, it's 2t. Uh, for dual unitary circuits, which wouldn't have time reversal symmetry, it would be t. So it is exactly, well, in this case, as I say, it's 2t, but so it's 2t. But then the second thing we can show is that there is a positive gap with respect to the rest of the spectrum. So that there is no other eigenvalue of unit, on unit circle uh, other than, than one. So we have this situation which is, uh, well, it's not mixing because the eigenvalue one is, is, is multiply degenerate. That's why we have result which is not one, but it's, it's related to t. <clears throat> and this is related, of course, this t. Now, what we are doing, basically, we are looking for the eigenvector of this transfer matrix which corresponds to eigenvalue one. And these eigenvectors, the fact that these eigenvectors are t-fold degenerate is related to time translation invariance symmetry, right? So basically now time is the new space. So we have basically a problem which is translation invariant in space now, in, which was the time, right? I mean, the, 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 the number of sides is t, right? So we have translation invariance in this space, and now we have basically eigenvector in each symmetry sector. We have the uh, uh, translation invariant decomposition of this, of this problem. In each symmetry sector, we, have, we can show we find a unique eigenvector, and that corresponds to spectral form factor being t. I mean, I think I will stop here. I will not go into any formulas. I wanted to flash through a couple of lemmas, but I think it doesn't make any sense. Uh, I mean, the key is in this kind of words, right? That uh, basically it's all about translation variance in time. Of course, I mean, this is the hard, hard part of the proof is to show that in each symmetry sector, the eigenvalue is unique. There is no other eigenvector, right? And this is the hard part, right? So this, is, this basically is algebra, right? It's to basically show that uh, the representations of the, some algebra of some operators, form of some operator is irreducible. <clears throat> okay, uh, right. So I think I've said more or less everything I wanted to say. Um, I'm open to questions, so I'm still here for a couple of hours uh, if someone wants to discuss more, but otherwise, please ask. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tomas, for the beautiful lectures. Questions? When you classify the dual unitary, uh, so the canonical representation when you are writing, so the JX, JY part you take to be pi by four, right? Uh, uh, so when you classify, like, when yeah. you start classifying the dual unitary in the yeah. previous lecture, yeah. and you write the unit U equals to, there is a JX, JY sitting, you set it to be pi by four, and here the self-dual limit is also pi by four. So is there any? Yeah, it's related, of course, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, this pi by four is kind of really halfway between two, two trivial cases. I mean, this is, uh, these models are very similar to these models that people discussed in the business of time crystals, right? Mm -hmm. Where they have this pi, I don't know how they call it, pi time crystal phase, right? Where one of these parameters will be pi over two. Now, this is just halfway between this, zero and pi over two. It's the most, um, yeah, I mean, since you ask, I think it's, it would be instructive to, wrote, to, to write a phase diagram of this Kick-Tizink model. All right, there is two parameters, J and B, which are crucial. And uh, from zero to, and basically you can limit this parameter space to zero, square between zero and pi over two. And uh, when two parameters are equal, this is like a critical, critical uh, line. Why critical? Because, I mean, let's assume first that there is no longitudinal field. 
So then this becomes a free fermion model. You can write a dispersion relation for quasi-particles, and in this line, it is uh, gapless. I mean, it's critical, right? So this model is critical in this line. But then it turns out, then if it's pi over 4, I mean, there is another line where you can also argue that the same. And the intersection of these two lines is this pi over 4, pi over 4, which is the, the coolest uh, point of this parameter space, which is both critical and chaotic. So that's why I also like to call it critical chaos. And since you asked, I mean, I, there are many things I forgot to say. But one thing which is absolutely important, I mean, after, after this calculation, we've shown the spectral form factor is 2t. Now, we did thermodynamic limit. So we pushed Heisenberg time to infinity. So we can only access the linear ramp, of course, nothing else. But it's, rather, it's extremely cool that we find this linear ramp for times which are very short. Because for generic models, we would find the so-called Taules time effects. Effects which are non-universal for short times and only appear to satisfy random matrix statistics after a time which is called Taules time. I mean, related to some either transport phenomena or whatever, something non-universal. This model, in these dual unitary models in general, there is no such thing. Spectral form factors start to follow random matrix from time one onwards, which means there is no time scale. In thermodynamic limit, there's no time scale, which means this is a critical cause, right? <clears throat> okay, I mean, I, this is, okay, so say, thanks for asking because I didn't forgot Thank it, but you. I think it's very important. All right. Uh, well, <laughs> thanks for being around the whole week, and uh, yeah, thanks to Tomas again for the nice lecture. <laughs>